Right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you're joining us from. Happy New Year 2021, and welcome to the first TinyML talk for this new year. We have a great series of events this year for you, uh, ranging from uh, the TinyML uh, Summit, Di uh, TinyML EMEA Summit, uh, various TinyML talks, and TinyML meetups. Uh, we're continuing this trend of a new format with one speaker per TinyML talk to give more interactivity and more time for a deep dive into the topics. Today, we have Andrew Baker from Maxim Integrated to talk about the future of personalized connected healthcare. My name is Ravi Sivalingam. I'm a research engineer at Qualcomm AI Research. We'd like to thank our TinyML talk sponsors. ARM, who's a TinyML strategic partner, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, Kixo, Reality AI, and Sinsense. Additional sponsorships are available. Please contact Betty at tinyml.org for more info. Just a reminder of the upcoming TinyML talks. On Tuesday, January 15th, we have Lucas Geiger, a deep learning researcher from Plumeri, on running binarized neural networks on microcontrollers. Same time, two weeks from now. All right, uh, Andrew Baker joined Maxim Integrated in 2009. He has 25 years of experience in the electronics industry in various roles on, in development engineering to sales to business and product management. In his current role, he leads Maxim's wearable solutions initiative for sensors and power management, as well as multiple other product lines. Andrew holds a bachelor's degree with honors in electronics engineering from the University of Portsmouth UK. Take it away, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Ravi, for the, the introduction. Um, so I have the pleasure of uh, presenting to you today the future of personalized connected healthcare. This is a very exciting area, not just because of the pandemic, but because of uh, changing attitudes towards uh, healthcare in general. Um, and really just to underscore what we mean by personalized healthcare is really about adapting the needs of the individual and really tailoring the, the healthcare to, towards that individual's needs. Um, and machine learning, algorithms, analytics is really key to the future of personalized connected health. So it's a really exciting topic for me to, to talk about today in the context of uh, of the tiny ML. So let's talk about the overall uh, vision of uh, where we see healthcare uh, transitioning to. Um, and we really see that it's a new model for healthcare delivery. Um, what we've seen from the COVID-19 pandemic is, is the desire for healthcare providers not to get direct contact uh, with their patients. Um, but the broader picture is the fact that uh, there's a big problem in terms of the spiraling global healthcare costs. So uh, it's basically growing at a higher rate than inflation. Currently around nine trillion, that's a, a big T dollars, um, which is roughly 10% of the global gross domestic product. So this is a huge amount of cost um, and it continues to grow and it's really uh, looking for a solution to mitigate that growth. So the, there's a number of ways in which uh, people are already looking at and implementing solutions to mitigate that cost. One of the ways in which probably most of you have experienced is telehealth or this digital health is the large umbrella. Um, remote monitoring, but that remote monitoring is also with analytics. So this is what also where machine learning algorithms and cloud analytics, as well as more importantly, at the edge machine learning algorithms uh, come into play here. So it's very difficult for clinicians and doctors to diagnose or really tell what's wrong with an individual by just looking at them. So that requires additional measurements and additional measurements require devices to measure those vital signs typically um, in order to get a, a proper diagnosis. So this is also where analytics comes in. You need to measure things, analyze the data, 
in order to make a, a good diagnosis. There are two other aspects of this digital health umbrella uh, that I'm going to talk about specifically preventive or predictive monitoring. So measurements are made in various use cases and form factors. You can see three specific form factors here on the slide. Uh, the one on the left is a very typical wrist-worn device. Lots of devices available out in the market today, widely available, very affordable. In the center is a new form factor. Um, it's what's called a smart ring. There's uh, vital size measurements that are made on a continuous basis on, on this uh, finger form factor. And then uh, more in the clinical space or so what we call prescription based uh, model is chest worn uh, monitoring devices, more in the, in the case of chronic disease management uh, or diagnosis. So the whole area of preventive or predictive monitoring is, is, is a big area in terms of uh, making sure that you analyze the data uh, and you apply uh, intelligence to give the clinicians more tools, more information to make a, a diagnosis or um, to form a course of action for the individual. Should an individual be uh, either predisposed or through poor lifestyle changes, uh, develop a chronic disease, in, in fact, six out of 10 uh, adults worldwide have or are dealing with a chronic disease or a chronic condition on a daily basis. So chronic disease management has a huge cost to the overall healthcare system uh, worldwide. So chronic disease management is, uh, is a way in, in order to mitigate that cost as well. And there are lots of tools either available today or emerging that can help clinicians manage chronic disease much more carefully so that uh, number one, you keep people out of the hospital. So hospitalizations are obviously very costly, um, but also give people a better quality of life. So let's talk about the opportunity here. It's a, it's a huge opportunity. So just in the wearable devices um, market, uh, in 2019, it's around 640 million units. So the market itself already is very large, but the uh, forecast for the market is up to 1 billion in 2023, which is not too far away, um, which is about 22% CAGA uh, between 2019 and 2023. So this presents a huge opportunity for semiconductor manufacturers like Maxim, as well as uh, machine learning and algorithm companies uh, to develop solutions that are either predictive or manage these chronic diseases. Andrew, uh, I have a question uh, just about the starting. Actually, this is a good place uh, as well. So um, in, in many of these applications that you talked about, uh, well, it, how many of these would you consider as fully automated, like human out of the loop? versus what I like to call uh, decision support systems, where, uh, for example, like most fitness trackers, really they're tracking some metrics and then it's up to the user to do something with those, with those measurements, right? So uh, what, what, do you see any of these being fully automated without any humans in the loop? I think um, it, there's varying degrees. So uh, talking about uh, just fitness trackers uh, as a start, so fitness trackers give indications of uh, progress generally uh, and also give indications of, uh, for example, they'll give you an indication when, when you should be ready for uh, you know, strenuous exercise again after uh, finishing exercise. Um, but generally they're just uh, indicative of what you should do. They won't necessarily give a specific diagnosis mm -hmm. and if you want, um, you know, more information about your overall fitness and health, it usually means that it needs to be interpreted um, by a, a professional. On the other side, in terms of the clinical side, um, so this would be, as I mentioned uh, earlier on, prescription-based model. So a uh, chest-worn patch, an ECG patch, uh, for example, I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, detection of arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats. Um, that would be a next step towards uh, providing a, a clearer diagnosis that would still need to be checked by a clinician. The device itself would not be able to provide a definitive uh, diagnosis 
uh, that somebody could act on. Uh, it would still need to be checked by a cardiologist in the case of an arrhythmia. Uh, in, in your opinion, is that a, a like a legal or you know, litigation related issue or more that the performance or accuracy is, is not there yet? Yeah, I think it, it, it's probably a little bit of both, but I think okay. uh, on the safe side, uh, you know, machine learning algorithms and predictive algorithms are getting better all the time. Um, but uh, the audience would know better than me in terms of the amount of data that's needed in order to make, a, if you like, 99.99% uh, you know, accurate diagnosis, um, you probably need more data. And there is obviously a liability there. And, uh, right. But uh, as the technology evolves, uh, the accuracy is definitely going to improve. Thank you. Welcome. So now let's uh, take an example uh, of a remote patient monitoring solution. Um, this just happens to be a model uh, that was put together for uh, the virus pandemic. Uh, this model could be used for other predictive, preventive, as well as chronic disease management solutions. Um, the main uh, difference here between the different blocks here is that on the top left, you'll see this predictive screening. So in the case of COVID, COVID pandemic, it's really uh, mass screening to look for signs of an impending infection or somebody developing symptoms. Um, this would typically not necessarily be a regulated device. It could be a, a device that's widely available. Uh, the analytics could be uh, regulated, but uh, the device itself would typically be a consumer device that you could get from your local electronics store or online. The onset monitoring, so the top right would be um, more of a prescription-based device. So should somebody be um, identified as, as having a condition, in this case, uh, COVID, um, then there would be a risk assessment done. So this risk assessment would be based on various things, including pre-existing conditions, uh, age, et cetera. Um, and then you would typically monitor more vital signs than you would for the predictive screening. Um, there would also uh, typically be periodic telemetry, may not necessarily be real-time uh, telemetry, um, but there would certainly be a, a lot of local analytics on the particular device. Uh, again, algorithms, machine-based algorithms that would, uh, would be looking for signs and changes to these vital signs that would indicate the deterioration in the patient. If the patient should continue to deteriorate, um, then uh, that would then trigger most likely 24-7 uh, telemetry. So the telemetry would be real time. So they would look for uh, changes in vital signs that would indicate that the individual is getting uh, critical. Um, this would also enable uh, people in a deteriorating condition to stay out of the hospital, uh, back to the original uh, problem statement of clinicians trying to not to have direct contact whenever possible, uh, but also delivering high levels of care. So uh, high levels of care can also be delivered using these remote patient monitoring solutions. Um, so with the uh, additional 24 seven telemetry, um, then the individual could be hospitalized uh, if their condition would become critical. So should an individual be hospitalized, um, then typically once they're discharged, so um, a discharge could be done uh, earlier than uh, typically it, it might be if you're not remotely monitoring these individuals. So they could be discharged to their home, but still uh, remotely monitored. And typically if, if the individual had been critical, um, they would also uh, have this 24 seven telemetry available to them. Should the individual relapse, um, then uh, it could be indicated immediately and action, uh, appropriate action should be taken. So now let's talk about some of the, uh, a couple of examples, uh, one about preventive or predictive monitoring. There's a lot of uh, discussion today uh, this comes on to your, your point, Ravi, about how reliable these uh, indicators are um, with, the, with the new algorithms that are really running on these devices. Um, this, uh, this is an example for AFib detection. So there are a number of devices already available on the market. In the consumer space, they are regulated by um, the regional regulatory bodies in the US, that's the FDA. 
um, for an indication. I would call it a first level um, diagnosis that there may be something uh, going on in terms of uh, having an AFib. So AFib is, is the most common form of heart arrhythmia, which is more generally a, 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 an irregular heartbeat. But more importantly, what, why it's so important to diagnose this is the fact that it increases risk of stroke by five times. So this is a significant risk increase for individuals. Um, and the other uh, really alarming thing about uh, AFib is the fact that roughly 50% of the individuals that have some form of AFib uh, are what they call asymptomatic. So they, they have no noticeable symptoms. So the only way in which you would know if you have an AFib is to, to screen um, using one of these types of devices. Um, so common symptoms for AFib uh, are, are listed here from the Heart, American Heart Association, racing heart, fluttering, palpitations, shortness of breath, or lightheadedness. So this is okay um, for individuals who have those symptoms. They can you know, go to their doctors. The doctors can prescribe one of these chest patches um, and then you, you basically get monitored over a number of days. Um, and then the data is analyzed um, through the machine learning algorithm. Uh, it'll make the clinician's life a lot easier by identifying the specific areas of interest. Whereas in the past, there used to be reams and reams of paper that a technician would have to go through and then circle the areas of interest. So this is a, this is a way in which machine learning uh, really at the edge is, is enabling clinicians to be more efficient in um, screening and diagnosing these kinds of conditions. So that's the first example of preventive monitoring. There are other examples, but um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on one. So the next example I'm going to talk about is really a way in which chronic diseases could be managed. Um, there are multiple chronic conditions um, that, that could be covered here. Um, the most obvious chronic condition that, that I can think of that I could have covered here is uh, diabetes. Um, for the purposes that, uh, you know, to broaden the scope of this presentation, I didn't specifically cover that one. Um, but this one uh, covers continuous SpO2 monitoring for certain types of chronic disease. Uh, to sort of broaden the scope of, uh, of the coverage here. So for example, uh, one of the chronic diseases which is very common today is called uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is a respiratory disease that affects uh, roughly 250 million people globally. So it's a big problem. And uh, continuous SpO2 monitoring of these individuals could become critical in, in those individuals that are uh, approaching what is termed as an exacerbation. So an exacerbation is usually something where the condition uh, gets to a critical point where they need to be hospitalized. So as uh, most of you know, hospitalization is very costly. It's very inconvenient for the patient, plus um, you need recovery time. So um, in the interest of both um, improving the overall quality of life of these individuals, as well as uh, reducing costs. Um, continuous monitoring uh, of this patient or these individuals can uh, better manage these kinds of conditions. The other area uh, that's getting a lot of interest right now is um, sleep disorders. So uh, this is actually very common and it's very common to be undiagnosed. So a statistic here is uh, 936 million people worldwide as obstructive sleep apnea or OSA. Um, this is where an individual actually can stop breathing in some cases for a, a quite an extended period of time um, and uh, causes a deterioration in the blood oxygen saturation. So this can actually become critical. In some cases, it, it can uh, end up the, the, the individual um, and dying from this condition eventually if it's not uh, diagnosed and treated. So this is also another uh, use case for continuous SpO2 monitoring. Um, if you take a look at in, in the market today, there are various devices already available on the market that are monitoring SpO2 continuously. And one of the features that may or may not be obvious is, is that uh, they're monitoring uh, specifically SpO2 conditions uh, during sleep. 
with a view to giving an indication of an individual uh, that has OSA. The other statistic here that is in the bottom left is um, people who are affected by asthma. So there's 300 million individuals that are affected by asthma. It's a very common condition. Um, and this is also a condition that uh, measuring SpO2 or blood oxygen saturation continuous could manage this condition much more carefully. The other big topic of today is the fact that I think this number is also out of date. This, this slide was produced a while ago. 48 million people infected with COVID-19. That's obviously a, a number that's uh, increasing every day. And uh, SpO2 monitoring um, is one of those leading indicators of an individual that's, uh, that's in a deteriorating condition. So again, uh, very topical. Um, but ultimately, any individual with any of these conditions that deteriorates, that is hospitalized, is very costly and inconvenient for the individual. So it's better to be preventive rather than um, hospitalize these individuals. Um, Yeah, uh, I had a question uh, about uh, even taking like the four different variants here. Uh, in, in the previous slide, you had talked about like 24 seven monitoring versus periodic monitoring. Uh, how does that apply to certain things like here? For example, obstructive sleep apnea, I assume uh, it doesn't have to monitor throughout the day, right? So uh, if, you, if you have a sensor like a fitness tracker that can detect that you're asleep and then it uh, tracks that. But even then, uh, for all these things, like how frequently does it uh, measure uh, for the for these cases, especially if they're undiagnosed? Uh, it, like, is it like, you no, know, you have to run it like 10 times a second or once an hour? Or do you have a, a, a like a scale of how that is? So um, you can set up these devices to have various uh, frequencies of measurement. Um, when generally when we refer to continuous measurement, it's not actually continuous, it's periodic. Um, and in the case of SpO2, so for example, uh, SpO2 uh, measurements are very motion sensitive. So um, any motion in the individuals that, that's being measured is problematic. So even the most sophisticated sensing and algorithms uh, are not able to discern um, the SpO2 signal and blood oxygen saturation in an individual that's really moving very much. So it's, uh, it, it's really a, uh, you know, something that you can only measure accurately when the patient's at rest, which kind of narrows down the availability of measurement uh, windows. So uh, that's why during sleep, um, it's actually very conducive to, to measuring SpO2 very, very easily because the generally the, the individual is, uh, is not moving too much. Um, but in, in specific answer, it really depends um, on the use case. Um, but uh, for example, most devices today, most wearable devices have an accelerometer or some form of motion measurement uh, available. So uh, if there's a period where, where the individual is still or um, at a point where they're not moving um, too much, then a measurement could be initiated. So that's typically what, what's done today is that when, when there's a, a quiet period uh, detected by the device, then it could initiate a measurement so that uh, measurements could be made uh, relatively frequently. Thank you. So let's look on, on, on more of the hardware side. So um, talking specifically about some of the solutions that uh, Maxim integrated, uh, we're working on. Um, one of the ways in which we, we uh, try to help our customers is to accelerate their time to market. So um, in today's uh, society, people want things you know, immediately. And um, really the pace at which this market is moving is quite, quite rapid. Um, in contrast to the typical way in which uh, the medical community uh, moves, it's relatively slow. For the last probably 50 years, a lot of technologies uh, haven't really developed in, in terms of the way that the patients are actually served within the hospital. Typically it's a bedside monitor. Okay, bedside monitors have developed over the years, but um, 
really what we're talking about now is, is a rapid shift in the way that care is delivered. So the availability uh, and the ease of availability of these devices is really critical to, to continue the rollout of these remote patient monitoring solutions. And the also also the, the other critical factor is to, to make sure that the form factors, whether it be wrist, chest worn, fingertip, rings, um, are readily available uh, depending on the, the use case that, that uh, needs to be implemented. So what we've done is put together some, uh, since 2016, some uh, platforms that you can evaluate and develop your use cases on, including machine learning algorithms uh, to accelerate time to market. Um, so it's basically putting together a platform, uh, whereas uh, people don't have to develop their own platform to develop the new use cases. Our latest platform that we just introduced in November 2020 is the Health Center Platform 3.0. Um, that part number is Max Ref Des 104 Pand, and that, that's available today. Implementing uh, ECG on the wrist, heart rate, SpO2 on the wrist, um, wrapping it up with uh, algorithms and uh, communication via Bluetooth to a host such as a PC for the analysis of the data. So it's really important to provide solution. Uh, OEM solution customers uh, with the tools in order to accelerate these, uh, these new uh, remote patient monitoring solutions. So let's talk a little bit about the, the value. So uh, as I mentioned, this is a risk form factor reference design. Um, six months is the development time savings that we believe uh, that this, this platform offers the customer. Um, we also offer clinical grade measurements. So this is really critical for the improving efficacy of these measurements so that clinicians and the like can rely on these measurements. Um, we adhere to certain uh, IEC and uh, clinical standards for the development of the solution. And it, it really is a complete reference design. So it, it, although you can't really cut and paste to, and take it to the market, it really gives uh, customers a leg up to make sure that uh, they have the interoperability with all of the components and all the solutions inside. Uh, and what's more critical, it really covers the critical vital signs um, that's needed today in typical remote patient monitoring solutions, uh, such as SpO2, ECG, heart rate, heart rate variability, um, body temperature, as well as uh, motion. Andrew. Uh uh, if I may interrupt a quick question about the previous slide. Uh, I mentioned that HSP 3.0, you know, uh, gets you faster time to market, saving at least six months in development time. That, that's, that's really great, uh, especially at a time like this when you have so many uh, companies coming out with so many products, uh, six months makes a huge difference in who's a, uh, who's a first into market. And especially in startups, you know, that's a, that's a big time difference. So can you explain a little bit more about how it saves uh, six months? Like uh, what do you factor into that? Yeah, so um, the first thing is the, the interoperability with all of the solutions within, within the platform itself. I'll, I'll cover uh, the contents of the platform in a minute, but uh, it's really making sure that all of those components within the system um, you know, interoperate uh, seamlessly. And that's also not just from a hardware perspective, but also from a firmware perspective. The other critical aspect of designing any kind of uh, wearable device um, is the industrial design. So the industrial design has a number of aspects. One is not, it's not just about comfort or look, it's also about the functioning of the device. So. Um, the wrist is actually one of the most difficult uh, places on the body to, to measure vital signs. Uh, for example, if, if you look at uh, most of today's modern uh, wrist-worn wearable devices, they have, in some cases, very complex optomechanical designs underneath. So this is the piece that's making contact you know, with the top of the wrist. So that um, optomechanical design is very complex in, in nature and, and the way that you design it in order to measure most effectively. Um, for example, in, in the case of an optical system, you're measuring heart rate optically, as well as SpO2. Since SpO2 is a very challenging 
measurement to make, especially on the wrist, because perfusion uh, or blood flow is very limited on the wrist, you need to employ some very um, you know, sophisticated uh, modeling uh, in order to get the best possible signal based on the available industrial design uh, size that you're trying to constrain uh, the device to. So all of that wrapped up um, is probably in excess of six months if you don't have that expertise. Um, but a lot of companies developing new use cases, especially in this health area, are really focused on the analytics. So they, they need a vehicle to measure the vital signs in order to uh, analyze the data. So um, really it takes away a lot of that headache um, from, from those uh, solution providers. That's, that's really great, yeah. Uh, I, I had another question on the slide, you know, the vital sign monitoring, uh, SpO2, ECG, heart rate, et cetera. Uh, can you uh, comment on how many of these uh, algorithms are using like machine learning or how many of these are using conventional signal processing algorithms? This is a question by uh, one of our attendees. <clears throat> Maybe I can, I, let me just flip to this one. So for example, sure. temp yeah, temperature trends, um, is probably more traditional um, algorithms. Um, so in other words, if you're trying to predict something, then it's typically uh, based on the machine learning is, is, is emerging. So for example, SPO2, uh, there's, there's more and more machine learning coming into it. Uh, SPO2 is really, uh, a, on the base of it, it, it's really a very simplistic ratio metric uh, measurement. Um, but there's more complexity in terms of uh, motion artifact, even though it's very small motion artifact uh, rejection, um, as well as uh, looking for other artifacts uh, to reject. So in any measurement, there's usually a, a bunch of confounders and uh, machine learning also helps uh, identify those confounders so that you can actually get the signal from, from the noise typically. And then uh, for example, sleep disorders you may, may look for a pattern uh, certain type of uh, patterns in the signal uh, and uh, more and more machine learning is used in, in that. Respiration rate typically is, is a, a more pure measurement. Um, there's a couple of ways you can, you can measure that. One is looking at the PPG signal, there's a circadian rhythm. Um, but you can also uh, typically in a clinical environment is using um, impedance across the, the thorax on the chest that's a, the clinically recognized method of uh, respiration rate measurement, but it's more of a pure measurement rather than something that you would typically use a machine learning algorithm for. Heart rate, there's a, there's a lot of innovation going in, in there. Machine learning is, is often employed there, um, it, especially when you're, you're under uh, severe motion, people running, exercising, uh, there's a lot of innovation going in there. Um, An ECG, uh, the, the example I gave for predictive AFib detection or any type of uh, arrhythmia heavily employs both um, on the device as well as in the cloud um, machine learning and, and even in some cases moving towards more artificial intelligence. So I think I've covered this. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So let's talk about some, some use cases. So uh, we've touched on some of the use cases, but um, really clinical grade use cases. So th these, are, these are use cases that could be of use to a clinician, a doctor to, to make a diagnosis of an individual. So in its most basic forms, for example, heart rate, there's a lot of, uh, we talked about uh, you know, the algorithms uh, developing even employing uh, neural networks, AI, uh, to improve the accuracy of, of heart rate. SpO2 respiration, again, there's a lot of innovation in terms of making sure that uh, you can measure those in different form factors uh, more accurately under motion, a little bit of motion versus under no motion. Um, the area of analytics, which is really front and center to the whole digital health or remote patient monitoring, um, could be either at the edge in the device itself, uh, as well as in the cloud. So um, you know, there's a lot more innovation going in there, trying to analyze people's sleep patterns, uh, stress. There's been a lot of talk about stress these days. Um, 
making sure that it's kind of an overall health metric for, for an individual. Body temperature, uh, body temperature is, is the most uh, measured vital sign. So it's, uh, it's actually very critical for a lot of the diagnosis of certain uh, chronic diseases as well as conditions. And then AFib detection is, is an area that there's a lot of innovation in terms of uh, machine learning to improve the efficacy and the accuracy of uh, the identification in most cases of these AFib events. There's been a lot of press actually about um, certain companies that, that have implemented AFib detection. Um, the, the instance of false positives is very, very high right now, but uh, over time what we'll see is uh, those false positives should, should slowly uh, reduce. Uh, and that's largely as a result of gathering more data and the machine learning algorithms getting more intelligent and being able to discern the, the false positives from um, you know, the actual uh, AFib event. That brings up an important point, like uh, compared to other classification type problems where the classes are relatively balanced, this is more along the lines of anomaly detection where the actual AFib event is very rare. I mean, if, you know, if, if all goes well, it's very rare. Right? Absolutely. And this is also a very, very key point, um, which is why uh, this intelligence at the edge, you know, machine learning algorithms within the device itself need to be super low power. So, uh, for example, there's, uh, there are um, a, a arrhythmia detection patches that are prescribed by clinicians today uh, that need to last between 10 and 14 days. So obviously then uh, power consumption, um, you know, battery life become very critical because you don't need these devices, well, you don't want these devices to be too bulky. So usually the solution um, to lack of power is add more power, a bigger battery, mm -hmm. but that makes the device, uh, you know, more cumbersome, uh, less friendly. So uh, having these super low, low power, efficient um, machine learning algorithms running on the device itself is, is super critical, especially with patients that are considered more at risk where they want this, uh, this telemetry. So if there's a significant event, um, then you need to be able to uh, communicate that to the, to the physician immediately. Absolutely. You don't want a cable going down to your pocket or your backpack carrying a heavy battery. <laughs> Absolutely. Because uh, people need to go about their daily lives. For example, 10 to 14 day uh, lifetime, you need to be able to shower, clean, exercise, go about your daily life uh, almost as normal. Um, so these devices actually are becoming uh, almost transparent to the user. So you, you apply the device, it stays there. And then uh, when the period of time is over, you just remove the device. Either it uploads um, to the clinician automatically or it's mailed back in, in some cases. Right. And, and that also helps with uh, compliance, right? Like the, the fact that it's sort of transparent to the user. Like if, I, if it bothers me, I might actually like remove it and keep it aside. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Com compliance is a big thing. And uh, the traditional way, which is very common today also, is um, what's called a halter monitor. So a halter monitor, if any of uh, the audience have, have had the displeasure of wearing one of these things, is very bulky, has multiple leads. It's, uh, it's very cumbersome. It, you can't really go about your daily life uh, in, in a way that you would normally like to. Um, but these patches, these chest wall patches are becoming less intrusive, um, getting smaller all the time, uh, more powerful. Um, so I think, uh, in terms of the mass screening, if you like, uh, of, of AFib and other types of arrhythmias is, is becoming a reality because of the, the new innovations in this area. Got it. Thank you. So now, now let's talk specifically about the Health Sensor Platform 3.0. This is uh, very typical for a, um, a wearable device, whether that be chest-worn, wrist-worn, finger-based. So the, the key elements uh, in here are really some, some form of processing um, device. Uh, in this case, we have two uh, specific microcontrollers. We have uh, a host microcontroller really running the main application. 
And then we have an algorithm hub really running all the machine learning and other algorithms that uh, are responsible for taking the signals from the sensors uh, on the device, processing them and providing them to the host for uh, either additional processing or communication to uh, the data collection unit. And this, this typically has you know, some power management uh, to make sure that the, the system is most efficient and then some local storage uh, if you need to locally store the device. If, for example, it doesn't have continuous telemetry. Then really the heart of the device is, is really the, the sensors. And in, in the case of this particular platform, uh, as I mentioned, we have ECG implementation on the wrist. Um, we have a, a continuous PPG. Uh, implementation for both heart rate as well as SpO2 or blood oxygen saturation. Typically in these systems, there's, a, there's an accelerometer for either um, using in the algorithm to, to reject motion or to give context um, to what the individual is doing at that particular time. In this case, we've also got a temperature sensor. So this is a continuous uh, temperature measurement solution, um, clinical grade accuracy 0.1 degrees C. And that's really measuring skin temperature. So um, although probably what's most important to clinicians is core temperature, um, but looking for trends um, in temperature change is also very useful for um, an indication of the changing state of an individual, whether they're getting an infection um, or other abnormalities going on with, with an individual. Temperature sensing, um, even if it's trending, is actually a very good window to, to an individual overall wealth, uh, health and uh, wellness. So in this case, we have a Bluetooth link to a, to a PC GUI um, so that you can uh, develop your own use cases very efficiently uh, on this platform. So a little bit more insight um, into the solutions contained within this platform. So this is one of the latest, uh, what we call analog front ends for uh, sensing. So this is a combined uh, PPG. So this is an optical analog front end. Um, so an optical analog, analog front end is, is for driving the light source. So in this case, uh, typically an LED. So LEDs, different uh, wavelengths, green, red, and infrared, uh, typically are used in these systems. And then we also have the input uh, from the photo detector. Uh, so the photo detector then um, takes the light that's been sh shined into the tissue, looking for pulsatile information. The pulsatile information that is then detected by the, the photo detector. That's really the, the essence of the uh, optical analog front end. In terms of ECG, this is what we call uh, biopotential. So um, this is actually measuring uh, electrical signals, uh, in this case, from the heart. Um, so this typically would need uh, a circuit across the chest. So in the case of a wrist-worn device, you need to make the circuit by, by touching uh, the electrode. And there's typically an electrode underneath uh, the, the watch itself for the primary measurement. And then the secondary um, circuit closure will be done using the, the opposite side finger. So the device uh, itself, uh, one of the most critical things in terms of uh, improving measurement on the optical side is uh, signal to noise ratio. So that's one of the critical things in, in making sure that you discern the signal from the noise. And uh, in the electronic sy uh, system, uh, you need to make sure that the SNR is as high as it could be. So the device is, is wrapped together with, with various interfaces and FIFOs so that uh, it can function within, within these systems. So really summing up, um, the wearable health revolution is really, and I, I strongly believe this, not just because of COVID, but um, because there's, there's really a change needed to mitigate that, uh, that cost to the healthcare system. Um, it really is the next big thing. Um, so all of us are involved in this area. Uh, trying to meet the demands for remote patient monitoring. So remote patient monitoring is the word uh, that should be used for this type of uh, market. And really the goal is to enable better predictive and preventive healthcare, as well as chronic disease management, as I talked about earlier. 
So really here at Maxim, our, our goal is really enabling personalized health. So with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, stay safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was, uh, that was a really insightful uh, presentation uh, and, and very topical, as you said. So um, uh, we, we have a bunch of questions. Uh, meanwhile, uh, while I bring up these questions, audience members, you may see a, a five question poll pop up. So please do answer them. Uh, hosts and panelists uh, can't vote, uh, but uh, yeah, pl please do answer them so that we can get a better idea of how you are liking the new format uh, of Dynamo Talks. So uh, questions, Andrew. So William asks, how does power considerations affect device capabilities and design? What are the most promising approaches to lowering power requirements for inference? Andrew, I believe you're on mute. Okay, so as with most engineering problems, it's, it's always a trade-off. So um, I'll take the example, which is most common in today's wearable devices, especially wrist-worn devices, is uh, optical measurement. So I, I talked earlier about um, you know, the design of the optomechanical solution for measuring optical on the wrist. So this can be quite critical in terms of uh, you know, the consumption of the overall system. So you can imagine um, that if you make your optomechanical system more sophisticated, you can gather more information from the amount of, uh, in the basic form, photons that you pump into the tissue in this case, um, then you can make the, the system more efficient. So um, there's always a trade-off between the industrial design as well as the, the efficiency of the system. But typically you can, you can trade off um, power consumption with the sophistication and cost of the overall solution. Got it. Uh, Kevin had asked a question about uh, core temperature versus skin temperature, which I believe you just answered. Do you have any other comments about the uh, discrepancy between the two? Uh, sorry, what was that question? Can, can you repeat that one? So uh, for temperature monitoring, uh, the, the difference between uh, needing core temperature measurements versus me actually the sensor measuring surface temperature, skin temperature, right? So uh, how does the discrepancy uh, between those two things, how is that addressed? Yeah, so um, this is one of these engineering problems that um, you know, there's a lot of debate in terms of whether it could ever be done. Mm -hmm. Measuring uh, temperature on an extremity and then correlating that to core temperature is extremely difficult. Um, not due, uh, largely due to the fact there's a lot of confounders. Uh, mm. So for example, uh, in a very closely controlled environment, uh, an example of that is uh, sleep. So, so for example, uh, temperature measurement during sleep is a much more controlled environment than during your daily life because uh, there's ambient, changing ambient conditions, whether your, your device is below your sleeve, whether it's in open air. Um, so in answer simply to the question is that um, it, it's extremely difficult to measure on a remote extremity and try to correlate that to uh, core temperature. Core temperature typically in, in the clinical environment, um, at least non-invasively, um, people use the axillary position, so underneath the arm, uh, which uh, allows much better correlation between that temperature that you're measuring and the core temperature. Um, the best way to measure it is invasively. That's the clinically recognized method, but uh, you know the axillary method is, is actually probably the best um, in terms of surface measurement rather than an extremity. Extremities are it is problematic. Right. All right, uh, another question from Kevin. Uh, why the extra M4F core on the algorithm hub when there are two M4F cores on the host? That's a very good question. Um, I'll plead that I'm not an expert on this particular area, um, but uh, this, this platform itself is just an example of how a solution might be implemented. So the, the purpose is really that you may not necessarily have two cores in your um, 
your host microcontroller. It may only be a single core. In this case, it is a dual core. So uh, Kevin's uh, comment is, is, is valid. Uh, however, if you do have a system that only has a single core in the host, um, then you can use the algorithm hub uh, as a standalone to run the low level uh, measurements whilst the host is in sleep. So um, you may not necessarily design your system specifically with this configuration. Um, the intent is to give, uh, give an idea of the type of solutions that could be implemented. Got it. And also uh, how much of the signal processing of the incoming sensors is happening on the host with the two M4Fs versus so that it doesn't have, does it have enough time to do the, um, uh, the ML number crunching on the same core? I yeah, that's so, that, right? yeah, yeah. So the the implementation uh, again, it depends on how people want to uh, split the architecture. But uh, the idea is that the all of the low level uh, acquisition algorithms will be run on that algorithm hub. Got it. Got it. So there's enough uh, processing power uh, for the typical implementations such as uh, heart rate, SpO2, uh, to be run on the algorithm hub. Got it. Uh, there are a couple of questions about AFib. Uh, is there any standard KPI for these measurements? For example, uh, what's the false positive rate allowed uh, for AFib detection? Yeah, I don't have the, those numbers off the top of my head, um, but there are some clinically recognized uh, KPIs for, for AFib detection. Um, there's, there's a number of papers written about this. There's a number of companies uh, that are providing solutions uh, for AFib detection, as well as more generally arrhythmia detection. Um, but th there are some standards. There are databases available, uh, publicly available, that you can acquire that uh, help you develop these um, these arrhythmia detection algorithms as well. Got it. And uh, we can always take these questions to the TinyML forums to answer them in more detail afterwards. Sure. Yeah. Uh, another question about AFib detection is, is it done with ECG? Is it done on demand or is it periodic? So there's two different systems. So typically a wrist-worn device is on demand. So um, th there's a two-step uh, solution. Um, so the continuous measurement would be done with optical. So then uh, if there's an anomaly detected with the optical uh, measurement, then they would prompt the individual for a secondary measurement uh, using ECG. So the, the, the recognized clinical method for recognizing and diagnosing uh, any form of arrhythmia or in specifically uh, AFib is using ECG. So it's really looking at the waveform. Um, optical measurements, they tend to be just basically what's the heart rate. <laughs> Um, whereas ECG, you can discern more of the, the shape of the waveform uh, in order to detect these different types of arrhythmia and specifically AFib. Got it. Thank you. A uh, few more questions. Um, any comments on the integration of these variables with uh, EHR, electronic health record vendors like Epic or Cerner, et cetera? Yeah, so um, typically, you know, these vendors uh, of, of these devices, they, they do have partnerships, they do have discussions with, with these EHR providers. Um, I think it, it, it's really a question of making sure that they're used for, for the right reasons in terms of what is the use case? What, what is the overall um, outcome um, that's desired? So it, this ranges from making sure uh, patients are getting more healthy, uh, so, for example, some uh, healthcare insurance companies have been providing incentives. Uh, even uh, on the corporate side, uh, corporations are providing incentives to their employees to do, you know, certain levels of exercise. The, whether it's monetary or other kinds of incentives, um, but uh, typically, yes, yeah. I mean. There needs to be a lot of uh, cooperation and integration between the hardware providers and the EHR or the you know, high level system providers, definitely. Right. And, and there's also the privacy concern, right? To know, oh, yeah. people have that paranoia of like whether 
Correct. We'll use this to you know, hike up my health insurance costs. Well, that, there's, there's, there's a lot of skepticism. Uh, right. Obviously, HIPAA is there to um, try to ensure the integrity of data, but that doesn't really you know, address the, the skepticism or the privacy about how they're going to use that data. Right. So there's, yeah. I think that, that'll be worked out over time, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's another question. Uh, what are your thoughts about the 21st Century Cures Act with wearable devices and related products in the healthcare market? That's, that's an interesting question. I, I'll have to take that one off, offline. Sure. Uh, I'm not very familiar with that 21st Century Cures Act. Yeah, I, I, yeah we, can, we can do that online um, on the forums. Uh, Abhishek had a question. How is the access to doctors handled or prioritized in 24-7 telemetry, considering current COVID scenario where uh, availability of doctors is a critical bottleneck? Yeah, so typically these would be um, nursing stations or centralized stations that somebody's monitoring. Um, and, and typically in these remote patient monitoring solutions, for example, on a, on a general ward, um, there would be a nursing station and then um, there would be alarms. So the, the biggest thing to, to make sure is it's, it's not a false positive. So often what happens is that um, there might be an alarm, but it's because, you know, maybe the, the device is moved. It's... So the first stage is you don't need to necessarily have a clinician's intervention. It could be just a technical issue with, with the, the remote monitoring solution. Um, so th there would be a technician looking at this, making sure that, you know, the, the measurement is actually true prior to um, making sure that uh, they get the right level of care you know, as needed. Yeah. And that, that, is a, that is a big concern about these remote patient monitoring systems is that, especially if you have uh, a false negative. So you, to a certain point, you can deal with false positives. <laughs> false negatives are, are a bigger problem. Yeah, especially in healthcare, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions about ML acceleration on the algorithm hub. Uh, like what algorithms are being accelerated? Is there like a hardware accelerator for certain algorithms or is everything running on the M4F uh, core? Yeah, in the case of this algorithm hub, everything is running on the M4F. Um, and, and really, again, the purpose is to make sure that the algorithm is running autonomously away from the host microcontroller so that you, know, you can power down the device into a very uh, low power state. Um, yeah. Uh, can you comment on the types of algorithms that uh, you have implemented in your reference implementation? Yes, yeah, so one uh, specifically uh, talking about the HSP3, the health sensor platform. So we have a quite sophisticated heart rate uh, motion compensated heart rate algorithm for optical. Uh, we also have uh, a, a, an SPO2, continuous SPO2 measurement algorithm running in that hub. Um, we don't have anything specific uh, other than with partners for uh, ECG. So we do have a partner that we're working with for uh, arrhythmia detection, uh, specifically AFib and a couple of others. Um, so it, it, for us, it's a combination of making sure that uh, we have the critical elements, if you like. So the critical elements we might invest in our, ourselves, but uh, we also partner with uh, external parties to make sure that you know, all of the critical uh, algorithms are available for our customers to run on our platforms. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, there, are, there are a couple more questions, but in the interest of time, I'll move them to the forums and uh, we can continue the conversation offline. All right, uh, we'd like to thank our Dynamal Talk sponsors again. Uh, ARM, uh, Architecting a Smarter World, Empowering Innovation Through AI. Oh. Sorry, getting a little slower. Deep Light, Using AI to Make Other AI Faster, Smaller, and More Power Efficient. Edge Impulse enables developers to create the next generation of intelligent device solutions with embedded machine learning. Maxim Integrated, enabling edge intelligence. The new Max 78000 implements AI inferences at over 100x lower energy than other embedded options. Now the edge can see and hear like never before.
Kixo AutoML for embedded AI, automated machine learning platform that builds tiny ML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Reality AI is a leading product development environment for edge AI tiny ML on microcontrollers. Sensense, Sensense builds ultra low power sub milliwatt sensing and inference hardware for embedded and mobile edge devices. Just a reminder again for our upcoming uh, next animal talk with Lucas Geiger on January 19th. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, happy new year once again. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.